I would first like to give you a brief background on Mother Teresa the so-called Saint of Calcutta. Then I will discuss why I say, a so-called Saint. Mother Teresa was born Agnes Gongza Boyaku in Skopje, Macedonia, on August 26, 1910. At the age of 18 she left home and joined the Sisters of Laredo, which is an Irish community of nuns with missions in India. After training for a few months with a convent in Dublin, she was sent to work in India. Agnes Boyaku took her vows to be a nun on May 24, 1931. In 1948 she received permission from her superiors to leave the convent school she had taught at since 1931 and devoted herself to working with the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta. Mother Teresa received permission from the Vatican on October 7, 1950 to start her own order, the Missionaries of Charity, whose primary task was to love and care for those people that no one else would. In 1965 the society became an international religious family by decree of Pope Paul VI. Some of the awards that Mother Teresa received were the Pope John XXIII Peace Prize, 1971, and the Nehru Prize for her promotion of international peace and understanding, 1972. She also received the Balzan Prize, 1979, the Nobel Peace Prize, 1979 and the Templeton and Magsaysay Awards. What most people know about the Missionaries of Charity came from a documentary about her order from 1969. The church and mainstream media refused any ideas from critics as not worth following. Now on to the unpleasant truth behind the squalid conditions that these poor people suffered in under the care of this order. I will be discussing accounts from a volunteer of the Missionaries of Charity as well as a former sister of the order. We will also hear from a documentary filmmaker slash reporter both of whom had seen firsthand what life was actually like in these aptly named homes for the dying. First I would like to bring to you a man named Donald McIntyre who is an investigative journalist. He went undercover as a volunteer in her flagship home in Kolkata, India. His description as to what he saw is distressing at best. Here is his account of what he saw in this home for disabled boys and girls. I worked undercover for a week in Mother Teresa's flagship home for disabled boys and girls to record Mother Teresa's legacy. A special report for five news broadcasts earlier this month. I winced at the rough handling by some of the full-time staff and missionary sisters. I saw children with their mouths bagged open to be given medicine, their hands flaying in distress, visible testimony to the pain they were in. Tiny babies were bound with cloths at feeding time. Rough hands wrenched heads into position for feeding. Some of the children wretched and cuffed as rushed staff crammed food into their mouths. Boys and girls were abandoned on open toilets for up to 20 minutes at a time. Slumped. Untended. Some dribbling. Some sleeping. They were a pathetic sight. Their treatment was an affront to their dignity. And dangerously anogenic. The first time I read this I was absolutely sickened at the thought of children no matter where they live being treated in such an inhumane condition. Now this account alone I would not just take at face value so I did some more digging and found out some other unfortunate tidbits of knowledge. The following excerpts are from a story in Free Inquiry magazine called Mother Teresa's House of Illusions by Susan Shields, a former sister in the Missionaries of Charity. She said, A.S. a missionary of charity, I was assigned to record donations and write the thank you letters. The money arrived at a frantic rate. The mail carrier often delivered the letters in sacks. We wrote receipts for checks of $50,000 and more on a regular basis. Sometimes a donor would call up and ask if we had received his check, expecting us to remember it readily because it was so large. How could we say that we could not recall it because we had received so many that were even larger? In that same article she describes an obvious hypocrisy. She states, Our constitution forbade us to beg for more than we needed. But, when it came to begging, the millions of dollars accumulating in the bank were treated as if they did not exist. In another part Ms. Shields describes the horribly unsafe and unsanitary practice in Haiti of the sisters reusing hypodermic needles until they were blunt in order to keep the spirit of poverty. When some of the volunteers offered to go and get more needles the sisters refused. At one point the missionaries of charity had around 50 million dollars in the bank. And yet they refused to offer the people that needed real help anything but dull needles and horrible living conditions. This is absolutely unconscionable especially for those that purport to follow Christ's teachings. Yet they apparently are obsessed with the suffering of others. This can be seen in some of Mother Teresa's comments. Such as, 
We see Christ in the broken body, and we touch him and that touches comes from that deep faith that Christ cannot deceive. To me that appears to say she needed the decrepit state and suffering of others for her to be closer to Christ. In conclusion, I am sure some fundamentalists out there are going to say I am lying and that I just hate Catholics and want to discredit a great woman. This could not be farther from the truth. I had no opinion on Mother Teresa or the missionaries of charity other than what I heard from admirers and the news until I started looking into her and her order and read the first-hand accounts of the conditions that these people lived in unnecessarily. Yet the blissfully uninformed seem to hold people like Agnes and others who walk around with undeserved adulation as society looks the other way when it comes to the atrocities that they commit. I want to make it very clear the history of the sisterhood does not necessarily reflect its current actions. If you find comfort, security or happiness in the memory and works of Mother Teresa and her order, I am not out to change your mind or defame Catholicism in any way but purely to inform people of the reality behind those they hold on high as examples to the rest of us. Now unto that end, until next time, courage.